Um, my name is Abriana Tosillo, and for those of you that don't know me, and for those of you that do know me, I'm actually getting a degree this year in something other than event planning. It's um, in mathematics, I know, it's a surprise to all of us. <laughs> um, so I like math, but as I went through my time here at BU, I started getting less and less interested in pure mathematics and more and more interested in what you can do with it. So this project is an exploration of um, mathematical <coughs> models for disease transmission of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. So we're going to have a great time talking about that right now. <laughs> um, let me start my timer so Maggie doesn't yell at me. <laughs> so in September of 2012, a 60 year old male patient was hospitalized in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia with severe pneumonia. During the course of his hospitalization, his condition progressively worsened. He developed kidney failure and eventually required manual ventilation in order to breathe. He, uh, 11 days after his admittance to the hospital, the patient passed away. Analysis of his blood uh, revealed the fact that he had been infected with a previously unidentified virus. This virus had never before been seen anywhere in the hospital or anywhere in Saudi Arabia. Further analysis revealed a link between this man's virus and an outbreak that had been unexplained five months previous in April 2012 in Jordan. So soon more and more reports were cropping out throughout the region. In 2013, a series of researchers convened to name the virus. They called it Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus. And this is a picture of an electron microscope that's been colored of the virus itself. So this is actually what the cells look like. So we fast forward to 2015 where the disease has been reported in 23 countries and counting. There are over 1,000 cases and 400 confirmed deaths. So there are still significant gaps in our research of this disease. We don't know its ultimate origin. Uh, although some people originally believed that the virus came from bats, uh, we now are starting to suspect that the disease enters a human population through camels instead of bats. Um, so MERS is a coronavirus, which places it in the same family as SARS. Some of you might remember SARS. There was a huge outbreak in 2003 that killed about 800 people in the series of a few months. So as far as we can tell, MERS is actually much more deadly than SARS. So MERS right now, we're expecting a case fatality rate of around 40% compared with SARS, which had about 10%. So even though there have been fewer cases reported and fewer deaths overall, it seems like it's a more deadly disease. So people are really concerned about the cause for um, a global epidemic. Um, so one of the areas that I was most interested in this project was transmission models, because uh, we don't really know how this disease is spread. We're not sure how it gets places. And in order to stop the spread of disease, you need to know where it comes from. So how does somebody get MERS? Um, we don't know, like I said. We thought originally that human-to-human -human transmission was not possible. So originally people were thinking that you could only get it from bats or you could only get it from camels. But since then, we've seen evidence of human-to-human -human transmission that can't be from an animal source. We've seen it come into ho in healthcare outbreaks and kind of take over a hospital one place at a time. Um, so we know that it's possible for one person to catch it from another person. So the portion of my project that I'm going to be presenting to you today has to do with asymptomatic transmission. Asymptomatic transmission basically just means that a person can get the disease from someone else and spread it to somebody else without ever themselves showing signs of symptomness. So you may have heard of like a carrier or something like that. It just means that you can be infected with the disease and spread it to someone else without actually showing any signs or symptoms. Um, so we've seen originally that this is not something that people are expected. So all the math models, which are not very many that have been constructed, use the premise that asymptomatic transmission doesn't exist. Everybody is relying on the principle that if you don't yourself get sick from the disease, you can't spread it to other people. So that's the current state of literature with it. But very recently, a paper was published that places the total estimated number of MERS way higher than anyone expected. So this paper came out and says that in a population of 30 million people in Saudi Arabia, they think that 45,000 people have been infected with disease. But we've only seen 1,000 total cases worldwide. So how could that possibly be happening? Well, there are two possible things. So either we're completely missing out on massive numbers of people getting sick and dying and passing this disease on to other people, or areas of surveillance are just not up to scratch to be able to find them, or asymptomatic transmission is occurring. So right here, I've explained via iPhone emojis different <laughs> transmission scenarios. Um, you can see up here, I have assumed for the case of this purpose 
that this comes from dromedary camels. An interesting fact about iPhone emojis is they actually have both types of camels. I learned that recently. There are two different types of camels. Um, this is the one humped or dromedary camel. There's a two humped or uh, Bactrian camel, which is not relevant to the study, but I wanted to bring that up. <laughs> Um, so here we see that this, this infected source spreads it to a sick person who spreads it to someone else who becomes sick, who spreads it to someone else and becomes sick. So every single person in this chain shows signs and symptoms. Then in the second row, we see that the camel itself can send it to someone who becomes sick, who spreads it on to somebody else who doesn't become sick, who spreads it to a third person who does become sick. So this link from here to here is asymptomatic transmission. So this would be hard to trace back to the original component of the camel. And then here in this third third transmission chain, this is even harder to figure out. So we have someone that comes in contact with the camel, doesn't get sick, someone who comes in contact with them, doesn't get sick, and then finally the third person, three degrees of separation with the original animal source, is getting, is getting sick. So that's really, really hard to trace because if you can ever think of, you know, you might know if you've seen a camel and you might possibly be able to tell if your friends have seen a camel, but it's really gonna be hard to tell if your friends, friends, friends have seen a camel. So this makes it way more difficult to trace. So this is a really ugly graph of what the model looks like. So for me, this is my project, is that I sat in a room many times and I thought about it. And then a while ago, I drew it all out on a whiteboard. And as far as I was concerned, that was the end of my project. And like I had it figured out and I was done. And then I realized that I couldn't uh, just take the whiteboard out of the photonics building and bring it here. So I made this PowerPoint instead. Um, so this is basically what I think the population looks like. So here you can see diseases coming in from the animal source, and it's coming into the susceptible population. So here in this project, we're modeling it to be um, people that are going to be likely to come in contact with camels. So these are people that are either camel herders or camel breeders or people that live in an area that happens to have a lot of um, animal husbandry in it. So they're the bridge population. And I've modeled it so that way the bridge population comes through, someone gets exposed from it from a camel source, and they either develop severe clinical disease, which are the reports that we're seeing, they develop mild disease, which are some things that we haven't really seen as much, and asymptomatic disease, which we have seen as well. And eventually, we see people either dying or recovering. So from here, we also see that there's a general population that comes out as susceptible. And this bridge population comes back on this dotted line and interacts with the susceptible population in order to expose other people this way. So it's kind of all connected together, is that there's one smaller population that's first getting the disease, then they're going back into the population and spreading it to other people like that. Um, and so in my model, what I've assumed is that if you have a mild or asymptomatic case, you're probably not going to die. You're going to either recover or just not get sick at all. And the severe cases have a probability of dying. So right now we've seen, again, about a 40% case fatality rate for severe cases. So what I'm testing in my model is, what is the probability, what is the likelihood, does it make sense for asymptomatic transmission to occur? Is that something that we think is going to happen? So one really important feature of this model is stochasticity, which is just a really dumb word that someone in math made up once to say, like, I just don't know, right? <laughs> so, so this also has to do with being random. So what it basically means is we make our choices a little more random and we make our results a little less predictable. So every time that I'm running the simulation, I kind of pick a random number out of a hat. And if the number matches up with a different transmission scenario, I plug that situation in. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But essentially what you need to know is that I don't know what's going to happen. The computer doesn't know what's going to happen. It just happens. So I let this run through for a period of time. I have a model that I made in MATLAB that we'll see in a bit um, that gives some results. And we can kind of interpret them and go from there. So assuming that all of my assumptions are correct, we should be able to predict certain things and test different hypotheses. So here we can see this is my predicted graph. So it goes from the beginning of the first human case in 2012 right until the date of the, recently report, the recent report in uh, December of 2014. So it's like a 33-month period. And this black line here is how many deaths we would expect to have happened if no asymptomatic transmission occurs. So this means that the people that are dying are getting sick because they got sick from someone who was already sick. Does that kind of make sense? Is that you can only get sick in this first scenario from someone who's actively sick. So like I could, you would be able to tell that I was sick with MERS, right? I would have severe respiratory failure. It would be pretty obvious to identify if you came into contact with me. And this green line here is showing what happens if asymptomatic transmission does exist. So that means that if I was sick but didn't know I was sick, I could spread it to you. You could spread it to someone else. It could go through a whole human train of transmission before someone, for whatever reason, erupted in the disease. 
And this little red dotted line here is how many deaths that we're approximately estimating have happened in Saudi Arabia. So right now we are saying that I think there's 382 deaths, something like that, in Saudi Arabia at this point in time. And one report suggested that about 62% of them have not been actually reported properly. So this is kind of our like very rough estimate of how many people have actually died. So we can see in this first scenario, it doesn't meet that point, right? Not anywhere near this point. Whereas in the second scenario, it goes far and above it. So now if we come over here, this is more, I think, uh, some of the more interesting results is that this is our recovered population. So these are all the people that came into contact with the disease, got the disease, either got sick and recovered, had a mild case and recovered, or never had any symptoms at all, and now have the antibodies to that virus itself in their system. So again, the black line is what happens if no asymptomatic transmission occurs. So this is saying that you can only get sick from other people. And right here we're estimating about 15,000 people would have these bodies, the antibodies in their body. And then over here, if we say that asymptomatic transmission does occur, we're expecting pretty much exactly 45,000, which is the estimate given from that paper I talked about earlier. And here you can see this red dotted line is actually the lower bound of the confidence interval that they gave. So a confidence interval, some just stats refresher or stats introduction, I'm sorry, it will be very brief, is that uh, in statistics when we don't know something, we create an interval. We say, okay, like it could be between 30 and 100. I just honestly have no idea. So this, this confidence interval is actually from 27,000 to 79,000, so that's a pretty big range. So this is the, the lowest bound of the confidence interval. And we can see again that in this, in this transmission model where asymptomatic transmission does not occur, it's nowhere near meeting even that lower bound. Whereas in the model where asymptomatic transmission does occur, it actually exceeds pretty much exactly where we expect it to be up here at 45,000, and it well exceeds the lower bound of the confidence interval. So what does this mean is that I feel comfortable saying that given the information generated by this model along with clinical evidence that there's evidence of asymptomatic undetected transmission of MERS in Saudi Arabia. And another really important thing from this model is that it's a continued public health threat. So if you go back here, we see that this is a pretty much linear slope. Down here, it's a little bit more curved, and it goes pretty much straight in either scenario. So this means that it's a consistent threat, is that every day, a specific amount of people are going to get sick and either die or recover from this. It's not something that's going to die out by itself. Um, we've also seen evidence that interhuman transmission can play a really big role in this, and that um, really small input, so even just a small population that may possibly come into contact with infected camels, can actually affect a huge amount of the overall population. Um, like all models, this one is definitely wrong. Uh, there's no such thing as a perfect model because the system itself is a perfect model. So what you're trying to do with a model is make one that's good enough for what you're trying to do. And I think this one is probably good enough for what I'm trying to do. There's a lot of assumptions that go into this that um, we can talk about if you have questions later, but there's a lot of assumptions that you make when you're modeling, and those are all like weaknesses that could kind of poke holes in it. So it's really important to continually assess this and go through. Again, because there's so few cases, there's really limited cl clinical data to kind of draw these parameters from. So all of this is completely variable as time goes on. So basically, we can study anything with this. It, there still needs to be way more room for improvement and things to go on from this. Um, and just ways to kind of look at it and figure out, well, what are some other options we could make for modeling? What are some other uh, suggestions we could make? and some things we can do. In general, this type of modeling is really important at this stage because we don't know so much about this disease. There's so little things that are actually known that any type of modeling at this stage can actually be a huge help in planning public health interventions and strategies for this disease. Um, and finally, I'd just like to say thank you to my professor, uh, Laura White from the Biostatistics Department. She was really great in this whole process. And thanks to my family, my friends, my fans, and everyone that <laughs> uh, watched my SNAP story. That was really helpful, um, really appreciated that. And also, thank you to the planning committee, because they did like way a lot of work for this. Um, and they sent a lot of emails, and a lot of text messages, and a lot of Facebook messages, and like a lot of different communiques, and I uh, really appreciated that. Um, yeah, I think I have like 15 seconds if anyone wants to make a question. Ask a question. <laughs> Oh, I have, I have two minutes. Maggie says I have two minutes. Ryan? Uh, oh, no. Question. You know what I do. Uh, limited clinical data. Mm -hmm. How did you decide what proportions of um, mild and asymptomatic people died and did not? 
Uh, that's a really good and specific question that I can probably answer is that so going off the assumption that there are 45,000 cases um, and we had only found a thousand of them I estimated that one out of 45 was your probability that you would develop a severe case and then out of serological data that came from contact tracing I found about one out of every 12 contacts that resulted in um, a mild case and then obviously asymptomatic would just be one minus those two added together hi Sophie <laughs> So I have a question about the health system, and I'm going to express to being woefully ignorant okay. about health services in Saudi Arabia specifically. Is it generally considered that people who need access to care would get it? Because one of one of the sort of epi, if you think about the triangle, right, or the the, the iceberg, right? We only right. see the iceberg. We only see the people who show up in care. Would we expect that there would be a lot of people in Saudi Arabia who would need care and not be able to? I think there would be a fair amount of people that would need care and not be able to get it, but something that is really important is that everyone that's in, clear, in care is going to be tested for it. Okay. So right now the protocol in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is that if you have severe respiratory illness or you have a contact with MERS and you have a fever or if you had any other kind of triad of symptoms, you get tested for the virus. So if you're at the level of receiving clinical care, you will be tested. Um, at least that is their protocol. Great. I have time for one more question if anyone needs to ask me another one. Steve. I'm just kind of interested, this might get too technical, but in a, in like in the epidemiology like curve or well, the mm -hmm. line that you showed, yeah. what causes a disease transmission to be linear over time? Um, so I don't have slides of this, but if I did, um, you would see that the level of exposed at a certain time kind of like levels off. So the amount of people that are dying and transmitting out the disease is pretty much exactly equal to the number that are coming in from the outside source of the camels and that kind of, so you can see like it's really, really hard to see in this graph, I'm sorry, but there's like this really, there's like a curve here. <laughs> there's like a there's like a little curve here and then it gets linear and that's when the um, disease kind of levels off in the population bye okay <laughs>